Um, as Nick said, yeah, I'm Graham Earl. I'm the Dean of the College of Humanities here. I'm an archaeologist, so I'm in the Department of Art and Archaeology, the School of Arts, as well as being the college, all of which Stacey is, is members, um, a member of. And I have the great honour to, to introduce um, her inaugural today. I arrived at SOAS about 18 months ago. I knew Stacey from her work, and I've got to know Stacey from lots of, um, lots of events, both boring and, and exciting. The exciting ones, particularly in the evening, with, uh, with uh, guest lectures and various events that SOAS does so well. Stacey is a generous and enthusiastic colleague. Her esteem, as we'll, we'll hear from Rosemary, in the, in the field is clear, whether in terms of the impact of her publications, um, the impact of her consultancy work, which is wide-ranging, and the impact of her research-led teaching on her, on her many students who, who love her and are inspired by her. That's been clear when I've been researching this short talk. Anecdotally, I was in Asia, I think it was in November, with some very, very distinguished alumni, and more than one of them said, wow, you know, Stacey Pearson. <laughs> when is she coming here? <laughs> Today, we'll rightly focus on Stacey's considerable academic um, achievements. But I also wanted to highlight one, one other th quick thing very, very quickly. So earlier this year, I sat on an assessment panel this year with, 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 with Stacey. And I think the care and the rigour with which she assessed and informed us all about various colleagues' proposals from all over the institution was really inspiring. Our university runs on exactly that kind of dedication and collegiality. Um, and I think it's, it's wonderful that, that, that she can do that as well as being able to do so many other things too. So a personal thanks from me for that. And also, I know, a, a vote of thanks from the leadership for, for your commitments to that as well. Stacey's talk is going to be introduced by Rosemary Scott. Um, I won't steal Rosemary's thunder. We've already agreed that. Um, so I won't talk very much about how they know each other, but I'll just give some very brief hints. Rosemary graduated from SOAS in Chinese studies. Chinese art and archaeology. She became the curator of the Percival David Foundation of Chinese Art at SOAS and then the head of the SOAS Museums Department. It was Rosemary who was responsible for setting up the gallery that's above us now when it opened in 1995. Today, Rosemary is the editor of the journal Transactions of the Oriental Ceramic Society, which has for more than 100 years been the leading journal in the field and one in which Stacey has also published, and of which she too was an editor. So, now I have very, very great pleasure in inviting Rosemary to provide her testimonial. Thank you very much, Rosemary. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm the shortest person who will be speaking tonight, so the microphone has to come down a bit. Good evening. I'm genuinely honoured to offer this testimonial today. There are certain former students in whose early career one is proud to have been involved and whose subsequent career and development as a scholar one has watched with increasing admiration. For me, Professor Stacey Pearson is one of those. Having taken a BA in History of Art at Lo Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, Stacy came to SAS in the early 1990s to pursue an MA in Art and Archaeology. It was then that I first met her, and I have to say was immediately impressed. However, in class, there was one thing that initially puzzled me. She paid very close attention, but she took very few written notes. It was not until a little later that I realised that she was deaf, and that in part she was lip-reading what was said. One of the many things that I admire about Stacey is the fact that she has not allowed her hearing challenges to hinder her development as a scholar in any way. Um, even though that development included learning Chinese, a tonal language, which can prove a serious challenge even to those with unimpaired hearing. Having successfully 
completed both her SOAS MA and a postgraduate diploma in modern Chinese at Ealing College, in 1994, Stacey took up the post of curator at the Museum of East Asian Art in Bath. And in 1995, I'm very happy to say, she was persuaded to return to SOAS as assistant curator at the Percival David Foundation of Chinese Art. The following year, in 1996, she published Earth, Fire and Water, Chinese Ceramic Technology, a Handbook for Non-Specialists. Having started her academic life in the sciences before trans referring her attention to art history, she was able to distill important aspects of Chinese ceramic technology in such a way as to make them comprehensible to interested non-scientists. And although this book is now almost 30 years old, frightening, um, I still recommend it, since it provides a clear and concise guide to the most important aspects of the topic. Also in 1996, she became deputy head of museums in a critical, and I'd have to say rather difficult period, leading up to the opening of the Brunei Gallery. I remain eternally grateful to Stacey, who along with John Hollingworth and his small team, worked tirelessly and without complaint to prepare the opening exhibitions. The only time I heard Stacey demur is when she realized she'd have to learn to curtsy in preparation for being introduced to the Princess Royal. Needless to say, she accomplished this with her usual aplomb. When I left the museum's department in 1997, Stacey was, to my great relief, appointed to take over as curator of the Percival David Foundation and as head of the museum's department, bringing new approaches to interpretation and display, as well as research, teaching, and the organization and publication of PDF colloquies. Between 1999 and 2004, as well as all of that, she completed a DPhil for the University of Sussex. And in 2007, published Collectors, Collections and Museums, the Field of Chinese Ceramics in Britain, 1560 to 1960, which had grown from the research that she undertook for her DPhil. This publication contained not only much new research on collections and collectors, including Sir Percival David, but also innovative interpretation and contextualization. An institution which was mentioned in discussion of several collections in that 2007 publication was the Burlington Fine Arts Club, which provided the topic for her 2017 publication Private Collecting, Exhibitions and the Shape of Art History in London, the Burlington Fine Arts Club. Perhaps surprisingly, the members and activities of this notable institution had not previously been systematically researched, but in doing so, Stacey was able to demonstrate its diversity, interconnectivity, and the importance to art history in England and beyond. In 2007, SOAS decided to divest itself of the Percival David collection, which went on long-term loan to the British Museum. And Stacey joined the then Department of Art and Archaeology at SOAS as lecturer in Chinese ceramics. In 2012, she became senior lecturer, reader in 2019, and well-deservedly in, in 2022, um, professor of the history of Chinese ceramics in what is now the School of Arts. She has always been a very productive scholar, and in the intervening years, she undertook a range of research projects and a large number of publications, some individual and some collaborative. In particular, I'd like to mention two of her individual publications, Chinese Ceramics, A Design History for the Victoria and Albert Museum, published in, 20, sorry, in 2009, and the remarkable From Object to Concept, Global Consumption and Transformation of Ming Porcelain for the Hong Kong University Press, published in 2013, which, to quote Joseph McDermott, puts the study of Ming and by extension Chinese porcelain in a wider conceptual framework, that of transcultural shifts in the use and meaning of art objects. Among the recent publications to which he's contributed, edited or co-edited are Collectors, Curators and Connoisseurs, a century of the Oriental Ceramics Society, 1921 to 2021, which was undertaken in association with the OCS Centenary 
and exhibition held here at the Brunei Gallery. And this, of course, was during Stacey's three-year presidency of the Society, which has only just come to an end yesterday. She published Visual Material and Textual Cultures of Food and Drink in China, 200 BCE to 1900 CE, um, which was the 25th of the Percival David Colloquies on Art and Archaeology in Asia um, in 2022. She was also editor of the Transactions of the Oriental Ceramic Society, as has already been mentioned, from 2010 to 2020. And she's been series editor for Routledge's History of Collecting and Material Culture, 1500 to 1900, since uh, 2019. Stacey's current project is a major book on the ceramic collection of the Freer Gallery in Washington, D.C., and this is being undertaken with Jan Stewart, the Freer's curator, and Blythe McCarthy, the museum's chief conservator. Interestingly, the three scholars are all writing about each of the objects from a different perspective, and it seems to me that this project exemplifies some of Stacey's major strengths as a scholar meticulous research, innovative interpretation, and positive collaboration. I can't think of anyone more appropriate to be appointed SARS's first professor of the history of Chinese ceramics than Stacy. Welcome, Stacy. Thank you so much, Romy. I feel like my job is done now. We can just go to the party. You've said it all. <laughs> um, no, but seriously, um, while I recover from the shock of that, I wasn't expecting it. Um, can I just thank um, everybody who's here? Can I thank the organizers of this inaugural, Nick and Carol, SOAS, of course, Graham, for your introduction, my family and friends, we came all the way out from California, so please. <laughs> um. <laughs> There's a lot behind that. So, um, also, current and former students, I can see you all. Thank you so much for being here. Um, and my department colleagues, thank you also for your support. But. More importantly, there are two people in this room who I would like to thank for um, shaping my career here at SOAS, which is essentially in two phases. And Romy basically talked about the first phase, so I'm afraid I'm going to have to, if I can move these slides forward. Oh, um, show you a picture of Romy Scott. And I chose this picture because, first of all, everyone knows that's best practice in handling objects. Do you see? <laughs> She's using two hands, and it's not touching the table, but her hands are. <laughs> so my point is, she actually didn't tell you that she taught me everything I know about museum work. She taught me how to be a curator effectively. Um, not only did she teach me object stewardship, object management, um, display, communication, but she always encouraged me to pay attention to detail um, in every aspect of museum work, which is not something that comes naturally to me, but it definitely worked because today I can't go into any museum or any exhibition without checking that the object labels and the text panels are properly hung and properly positioned. And if they're not, I always think to myself, oh, should have used a spirit level. <laughs> and those of us who worked for Romy will understand that joke. <laughs> so thank you very much for that. Now, the next person I want to thank is the person who um, helped shape the next phase of my career. So as Romy mentioned, she sadly left SOAS. And at that time, I also I took over the Percival David Foundation, but then I also embarked on a PhD at SOAS. So um, I started working with someone else who's very important, and that is 
Professor Craig Clunas. Hope that picture is okay. <laughs> and Craig is the one who really taught me to be a scholar and a teacher. Um, as a scholar, I really gained so much from being his student and his colleague. And really from practical tips on how to transition from writing museum texts to writing a PhD dissertation, um, and how to employ tools from other disciplines and other scholarly fields in my work, um, such as museum studies and the history and theory of collecting, which helped to shape so many of the arguments in my Sussex dissertation, where he was working at the time, um, and as you've heard, in my subsequent work. So um, another thing I really gained from Craig is that he really, he modeled a way of evaluating artworks and artistic practice um, which breaks through the disciplinary boundaries that often constrain scholarship. Now, as a teacher, I also learned a lot from Craig because he kind of led by exemplary example um, in a way that he was able to, is, I should say, able to engage students but also challenge them. And I'm very grateful for that. I mean, I'm not saying it wasn't challenging to be his student, but it was in a very good way. So thank you very much for that. And speaking of challenges, there's one more person I'd like to thank for something very specific. And I'll just say this person has no idea what's coming up. So just be prepared. So the person I would like to thank is <laughs> my younger sister, Dr. Patricia Pearson, who, um, <laughs> so Patricia um, is an academic and she works at the University of California, Irvine, um, and she's a comparative literature specialist, which was very helpful because about 20 years ago or so, I was having what I can only describe as a critical theory crisis. Um, <laughs> Because I just, I was still working in the museum. I just started doing my um, dissertation, you know, with someone who knows a lot about critical theory. And I got a paper accepted at one of our industry conferences, which at the time was usually pretty combative. And that was the College Art Association annual conference. And so I was a bit concerned that I was going to give a paper and somebody in the audience would ask me a question about a critical theory I'd heard nothing about. So I was telling my sister this, and she's like, don't panic. There's something called the Dictionary of Critical Theory. <laughs> and this is how you use it. And so I, she taught me how to use it. I read through it on the plane. And I'm so grateful that I did, because sure enough, I gave a paper on Ming porcelain, pretty tame, I thought. And somebody <laughs> in the audience said, but you haven't addressed the underlying discourse. And I thought, oh my god. Um, <laughs> and, I said, and then it clicked. I said, oh, but further to the archaeology of knowledge, I understand Chinese porcelain to be non-discursive. <laughs> So thank you. Thank you, Patricia, for helping me through that crisis. It really saved me professionally. <laughs> now, in fact, um, Foucault aside, what, <laughs> what really informs my work on Chinese ceramics is um, methodologies and data from three disciplines, as Romy sort of hinted at, archaeology, material science, and art and design history. Now, of course, I should say Sinology, but I came to China through ceramics. And actually, I came to SOAS for the same reason. And at SOAS, of course, I was here for the collection. And that was the Percival David Foundation collection, one of the finest collections in the world. And it was founded, of course, by Sir Percival David. And thank you. I forgot to advance the slide. There, there he is, Percival David, and that's a view of um, one of the old galleries at the Percival David Foundation. So, um, of course, it was home to this collection for 50 years, and I had the opportunity um, to be its last 
curator. And one of the projects I'm currently working on is a biography of David and the collection. So um, I have discovered something that has made me extremely grateful that he decided to donate his ceramics collection to the University of London and um, not something else, which is stamps. <laughs> and I mean, apologies to any philatelists in the audience. This stamp collection is very impressive, but I really can't help thinking I had a lucky escape there. <laughs> um, now, in the stamp world, Percival David has the same kind of name recognition as he does in the Chinese art world. But it is through ceramics that he became the iconic collector and scholar that really enabled him to found a new field of inquiry, that is, you know, the history of Chinese ceramics. So I think I owe it to him as well that I'm now the first and perhaps only professor of the history of Chinese ceramics. So I'm very grateful to Percival David. Now, I would like to um, move on to my lecture this evening. And in these inaugural lectures, it is traditional for um, the recipients to talk about important world-leading research in what our vice chancellor calls the majoritarian world. And many of my colleagues here do this in very profound and impactful ways. So you might be thinking, well, I'm not sure Chinese porcelain is really comparable. But I think you would be wrong because um, what my work and my approach to it has shown me and I hope my students um, and my readers is that um, Chinese ceramics are a window into so many subject areas. Ceramics, obviously, but also China and its history, the histories of technology, global trade, object movement, design history, what else, um, cultural intersection, consumption and the world of goods, as it used to be called, food studies, etc. So contrary to the title of a lecture I actually gave recently in Asia, which was titled Blue and White, How Chinese Porcelain Changed the World, I can't really say that Chinese porcelain changed the world, but um, it does help us to understand the world, particularly human creativity, and materials. So what I'd like to do now is talk about an example of the, a way of consuming Chinese porcelain that might be a little bit surprising, but that illuminates a lot about the material itself and how people treated it around the world. So my title is um, Chinese Porcelain and the Art of Upcycling. I often hear what I'm about to discuss described as recycling. So I would like to start with some definition because um, they are actually quite different things, upcycling and recycling. And they're both ways of reusing materials, but recycling takes old materials and breaks them down um, into new materials that can be used for creating new products. Um, a good example of that would be this. That is turning plastic bottles into trainers, for example. Now with upcycling, however, oops, sorry. Upcycling takes old materials and transforms them by reuse into something new, sometimes something better as well. So, with upcycling, you retain the integrity of the original materials, but you reuse them to make new products. So a common example of this can be seen in fashion, um, where you also see, I think, that upcycling is a form of customization. So here's an example, which is fairly typical, where a pair of denim jeans has been 
refashioned into a dress. So you can see the top part would be like the waist part. And then the bottom is really just cut up to create the skirt. So the material has remained the same. It's just been reused in the form of a new garment. So that's upcycling as opposed to recycling. Okay, so I first encountered this idea of upcycling or this practice um, on a trip to China. When I visited in the 1990s, you know, the really the self-styled home of Chinese porcelain, Jingdezhen, and I saw this wall just outside Jingdezhen in this area called Sambao. And it was clear that um, they had used both porcelain shards and vessels in the building of this wall. I hate to say build the wall now because I cringe every time I say it, but apologies. What you can see, I hope, is that in building this wall, um, they used both whole vessels and broken ones. They did this not for structural reasons, and so it's not necessarily essential to the building of the wall, but they use finished products as building materials for the construction of the wall. And once I realized this, I began to see it everywhere. So the four examples I'm gonna show this evening, here you can see in um, new objects, in boxes, in I guess you could call that fashion on the far right, and even in architectural decoration. So another um, key encounter I had with this practice occurred when I visited an exhibition in London at the Royal Academy in 2005, and it was called Turks, A Journey of a Thousand Years, 600 to 1600. And it included a number of Chinese porcelains from um, the Top Tapi Palace collection, which is now, that was the former Ottoman palace in Istanbul, and it's now the museum of the palace. And one piece in particular really seemed to exemplify a method of consuming Chinese porcelain vessels that reflected a different way of thinking about porcelain as a material. So in this piece, which is an incense burner constructed from two Ming bowls and a dish, several craft techniques were used and were employed to manufacture a new object from porcelain vessels. First, the bowls were decorated with jewels embedded in gold and then placed mouth to mouth to form a sphere. So that's the top part. The foot of the top bowl was cut away to make room for this kind of um, filigree panel, if you will. And then the sphere was attached to the dish with a gilt stem, which was also embedded in the dish. So what the result was is a transformation of three food vessels from China into a completely different type of object in terms of form and function. So this is now an incense burner, no longer food vessel. And this very creative form of object manipulation was practiced in other materials actually in the Ottoman palace workshops, including jade. And it demonstrates, I think, both technical mastery of materials as well as a different kind of concept of object classification and function. So these rejeweling and redecorating techniques through jeweling were used on a number of different materials, but when it comes to Chinese porcelain, it was also the nature of the object's forms, the bowls and the dish, that helped inform the new design of a completely new object. So the sensor looks like it does because the original bowls and the dish are those shapes. Now this similar practice was also used in 18th century France. And um, for example, this vessel, 
which was also made from fired porcelain objects from China. And these are mounted porcelains, as they're known, that were created, well, the objects created from them, were ordered by what are these luxury furnishing de dealers called Marchand Mercier in Paris in the 18th century. And I think you can see in this case, too, it's a form of customization through upcycling. And it is, in the fact, the way they mounted it and the designs on the mount has also redesigned them within the neoclassical design idiom that was fashionable at that time. So these types of porcelains, which have a completely different design context in China, could be transformed into whatever was fashionable in, for example, France at this time. Um, I, have to, I should say it's not necessarily whole objects that were used in this way. Um, I would say that um, one thing we need to bear in mind when we look at what's been done to these objects is they are being damaged. Um, they're being damaged in the process of recreation. Um, and the damage that's done to these vessels by these, for example, the Ottoman court workshops, um, the French furniture makers, is basically incidental. However, there are some cases where the damage is actually entirely intentional, and whole vessels were broken down um, to create new objects. I think one of the most interesting examples of this is, in my view, this box, which is in the Bose Museum in Barnard Castle, which is in the north of England. You can see it on display in the gallery on the right. And this particular piece is a casket or a box with a wooden core, and it's been faced with porcelain plaques, so Chinese porcelain plaques, and fitted or secured with gilt bronze mounts. It was created around 1720 to 1725, possibly in Vienna, and it belonged to the Duke of Lorraine, and it was sold following his death in 1781. And it's actually the construction of it which interests me the most, because I hope you can see in this detail, the porcelain panels have been cut to fit onto the sides and also the lid of the casket where you can see a bowl. And they are made to fit that particular casket form. But more interesting, of course, is that it wasn't porcelain tiles or plaques that were cut to fit this box. It was actually vases that were cut down, square-sided, most likely, vases, and they were the lid of the casket as well, and a similar dish is on the right, was also cut from this bowl or a bowl like this to fit into the top of it. So I actually have examined this casket in person in the museum, but it wasn't possible to see behind um, the backs of the panels because the wooden liner is quite closely fitted and I wasn't allowed to take it out, sadly. But there was an unfortunate accident in a museum in Vienna, um, the Silver Vault Museum. And in 2005, a window cleaner had an accident and fell on one of the display cases. I know, all the museum people in the audience just winced on that. So yes, this is a, obviously a horrific <laughs> event for a museum and my heart goes out to the cleaner as well, but this nightmare scenario um, meant, of course, that several of the porcelain pieces that were on display were heavily damaged. One of them happened to be the companion piece to the one that's in the Bose Museum. So same size, same type of construction, but made using mostly Japanese porcelain panels, and the mounts are silver instead of gilt bronze. And 
the conservation work on this damaged casket led to some really interesting discoveries about its construction, which can be seen in the next images. So the cut down porcelain panels have been set into frames and backed with the wooden liner, as we saw. So you can see the wood on the top left here. And in order to flatten the natural curvature of the walls of the panel, playing cards were used to pack it out and even it out, which you can see on the top. And I think this is really another great example of upcycling. So both of those caskets represent what I would call sort of clear examples of destructive reconstruction um, in the service of upcycled creation. And the destruction of these porcelain vases to make plaques or panels for the caskets, of course, also indicates the relative value of those vessels in the collection of the Duke, um, but also in the market for um, such porcelain in 18th century Vienna. And I think um, an interesting commentary on the suitability of Chinese porcelain just for this type of practice um, can be seen in the intentional making and breaking of new vessels to create shards for reuse in the representation of a different material. So in 2010, the Chinese artist Li Xiaofeng created a new version of the iconic Lacoste polo shirt um, using porcelain shards that had been themselves created by intentionally breaking newly made vases. Um, and I think you can see that in the next slide quite clearly. So um, you can see the shards in detail on the right. Now the pieces were then sewn together with metallic threads, creating a garment. Now those of you who are familiar with Chinese art might recognize this technique, perhaps seeing a reflection of a famous suit made of jade dating to the Han Dynasty. And this was, of course, a conscious echo by this artist who has, in fact, closely referenced this in another garment made from shards, which you can see on the right. And this one is allegedly made from broken antique celadon. Now, of course, as a historian of Chinese ceramics, um, I'm quite disturbed by this intentional shardification of antique vessels, but the effect is the same. Upcycle creation as the product of a cycle of making, breaking, and remaking, utilizing what I think can be seen as really one of the original universal materials. Now, I started this talk with an example of a wall in Jingdezhen. So I'd like to move into the last part of it by highlighting historical and modern examples of the use of Chinese porcelain vessels as tiles, whether in the form of randomly shaped shards or as whole vessels utilized for this. One of the earliest surviving examples of this was discovered by archeologists in the 1980s on what is known as the Swahili coast. So that's in East Africa, mostly um, Tanzania and Kenya where from the 13th century onward, Chinese ceramic was used as a decorative element in what are known as pillar tombs, and also on the facades of domed tombs, which were reserved for the elite families who controlled trade and therefore had access to imported ceramic. Now this part of East Africa was also part of the Islamic world, for much of its history, and there is a very strong connection between ceramics, often imported Chinese ceramics, and elite or religious architecture within that wider culture. 
And two very famous examples, if you know about Islamic architecture, are important religious sites in what was Persia. Here, Chinese ceramics were embedded into the walls of important buildings. So the, the ceramics would have been embedded in those niches that you can see. And the one on the right is the famous shrine at Ardabil, and the one on the left, slightly earlier version, at the Ali Kapu Gatehouse in Isfahan. And I think it's important to note that the Islamic world was also the conduit for the arrival of Chinese porcelain in Europe. The earliest examples of which were brought into what was Arab Spain in the 10th and 11th century. So it is not surprising, I think, that Chinese porcelain should have been used in architecture in the Iberian Peninsula as well, where my next example can be seen. So in one of the garden rooms at the 17th century Frontera Palace in Lisbon, Chinese porcelains were used to decorate a shell grotto in the Casa do Fresco, don't speak Portuguese, trying, um, which actually translate to the wonderfully named House of Freshness. So the palace was built in the 1670s and it was a summer residence for the Mascarenas family, which had survived the notorious 1755 earthquake that flattened so much of Lisbon. And it's now home to the largest collection of 17th century Portuguese tiles in situ because it survived that earthquake. The grotto at the palace is one of several structures that was built in the palace garden and it's a type of building that was developed in antiquity, then revived during the Renaissance, where it, when it kind of spread throughout Europe. In Lisbon, this was blended with an Islamic architectural style in a kind of Iberian approach to facade surfacing that draws upon the mosaic tradition. If you look at this detail, I think you can see that design legacy quite clearly in the way in which both whole pieces and shards were used as tiles and embedded in the walls alongside shells in a really small scale, dense mosaic-like pattern. The combination with shells, of course, also reflects a historical understanding of porcelain in Europe because before porcelain was discovered to have been made from clay, it was thought to have been made from shells. And some even attribute the origins of the word porcelain to a derivation of the word for cowrie shells in Italian, porcellana. So I would like to finish this talk with an example that represents what I think is perhaps the truest expression of Chinese porcelain and upcycling, as well as the extremes of design. The porcelain house in Tianjin in China um, was created by a ceramics collector who entirely refaced an old colonial building inside and out with porcelain vessels and shards in I think a really kind of Gaudi-esque <laughs> fantasy of uh, transformative design. <laughs> and it, of course it's kind of at once disturbing but also <laughs> fascinating, right? Um, with an almost kind of undulating surface that utilizes fired porcelain as the ultimate sculptural material. And here, upcycled porcelain vessels and shards made from them um, <laughs> have transformed the surface texture in a very notable way, as well as the appearance of the building um, in a way that kind of coarse damage and really delicate shimmer are juxtaposed. And you get that sense when you see it in daylight. And this creates a new, and maybe not entirely desirable, <laughs> um, architectural aesthetic that nonetheless recalls this 
historical European precedent that I mentioned. So in this building um, and in the other examples I've shown, I hope um, that you can see that while Chinese porcelain vessels have always been valued for their primary material qualities and visual characteristics such as translucency, white color, um, glassiness, perceived fragility. It is the hidden strength of the base material that ensures that these vessels could be used for other upcycled purposes, you know, the fired porcelain itself. And we shouldn't forget that this base material was invented in China and the products made from it became almost universally popular. With a global impact on design that suggests perhaps that maybe Chinese porcelain did change the world just a little bit. <laughs> so thank you very much. Yeah. Wow. Um, Stacy, you, you gave what was a very self-effacing talk, particularly at the beginning. And yet I think Stacy's talk overflowed with original and fascinating insights. Um, I don't think it was the poorer for the relative lack of Foucault. I do think it was rich in critical analysis of complex and beautiful things. And so I think we should end by yet again thanking Professor Stacy Pearson for an amazing talk. Last things. Thank you, Rosemary. That's a fabulous introduction. Uh, thank you to Stacey's family and friends for coming here from near and far. And thank all of you for coming here as well and celebrating today with us. And now to the reception, which is just that way. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you very much.